let's talk about the grid. First of all, why would we want to do such a thing? Because electricity is becoming uh, a larger factor, maybe even a key factor, in controlling the development of renewable energy. One of the fantasies a lot of people have is to try to stop using fossil fuels and electrify virtually anything that can be electrified. And if you do that, you're going to be relying on the ability to green the grid, get carbon-based fuels out of the grid, and uh, in order to make this uh, a carbon-free system, even with re the understanding the nature of the grid itself is an important way to have a context for the policies that we're going to be looking at and to help to grasp why it is that some things fit within the federal jurisdiction and some things fit within state jurisdiction. Most of us have, I think, a basic understanding about the grid, and I want to offer this as a brief refresher course just so that people can have these concepts in mind going forward. So first, what is the grid? The grid, as we're talking about it, is everything from the utility meter to the power plant, or from the power plant to the meter, if you're thinking about it from a production end of things. So when you're talking about the grid, you're talking about generation, you're talking about transmission, distribution systems to break down the power that's traveled in, the, in high uh, voltage transmission lines, and then the end users themselves, which are often referred to as load. You can talk about demand or you can talk about load. Basically, we're talking about the two, two of the same things. Let's talk a little bit about electric generation. What are we doing when we're generating electricity? Well, probably some of us have been exposed to this uh, maybe in a science class, maybe in junior high or high school even. How do you make electricity? You take a bunch of wires and you spool them around each other and then you take a, ma a magnet and you move the wires past the magnet and the result is you generate current. And all that a power plant does is takes much bigger spools, much bigger magnets and moves them past each other faster and faster in order to uh, generate more electricity. This is a picture of a portrait of a copper atom. And the reason we want to look at that is you can see all these dots, all these gray dots. Those represent electrons. It's the motion of electrons that produces electric current. And, uh, and so we like, you like to have uh, some kind of a metal that has a lot of electrons to help with that process. So copper is considered to be a particularly good electrical conductor. So what's going on when we talk about about uh, electrons and the generation of electricity. Uh, it's the movement of the, of the magnets past the, the wires that, that stimulates the electrons and causes them to move. But how does that relate to electricity? Well, let's think about playing pool. Here's a little example to watch. Beautiful, isn't it? Well, let's, let's think about this again. Imagine that the cue ball, the white ball, is an electron. And then the black ball, that's an electromagnetic field. And what happens is the electron gets excited, doesn't move very far, but what it does do is it gener helps to generate an electromagnetic field, and that moves much further, much faster. And so electricity is very much the same thing. Electrons really move very slowly. They don't disappear, they don't get consumed during this process. In fact, they just go a few feet per second, but electromagnetic fields can move at the speed of light. That's because they basically have no mass, they have no weight, and so they can move much faster. And it's the flow of these electromagnetic fields that produces an electric current. Um, let's get some terminology under our belts. We talk about kilowatts and kilowatt hours, megawatts, megawatt hours, and so uh, let's try to get some of those terms under our belt. What is a kilowatt hour? Well, it's the amount of power needed to light uh, 10 40-inch LED TVs and run them for one hour. Gives you some sense of it. Well, probably not quite enough. A kilowatt hour, again, is the power needed to run 10 of these TV screens for one hour. What's a megawatt? A megawatt is a thousand kilowatts. What's the relationship between a kilowatt and a kilowatt hour? Kilowatt tells you how much power you can produce at any one particular instant. A kilowatt hour 
talks about how much power you're producing over the course of time. And so a uh, kilowatt hour itself is actually a dynamic thing. It reflects the movement of electricity over some distance for some period of time. So a kilowatt is what's produced uh, and what would be needed if you ran it for an hour to run 10 of those uh, TV screens. So a thousand kilowatts uh, is a megawatt. And a thousand megawatts is a gigawatt. And we're going to be talking about megawatts and gigawatts a lot during the semester. A gigawatt is about the size of a fairly large power plant, either a nuclear power generating unit or a very large coal-fired plant, or maybe sometimes even one that runs on natural gas. But um, it's the very largest units that fit in those dimensions. To give you an idea of how much power is consumed, uh, this was, uh, these are figures from the United States back in 2007. Four million gigawatt hours of electricity were used in the United States over the course of 2007. Well, how do we grasp that? Well, I tried to think of it in terms of light bulbs uh, or TVs. If you had four and a half billion light bulbs, bright light bulbs, 100 watt incandescent bulbs, and you burn them all day and all night uh, for the whole year, then you'd be using the amount of electricity that was used in the United States in, in 2007. Yeah, or if you want to break it down per person, about 13 bulbs per individual burning for that period of time. Still a little hard to grasp. So I uh, made a phone call to the people who run the Giants ballpark. It used to be called AT&T. Now I think it's called, uh, I don't know what it is, Oracle or something. Uh, so I asked them, how much power do you use to run your lights for night games? And the answer they said was met one megawatt of power. If you took all the light bulbs together, uh, that would be one megawatt. So if you have to burn those lights for one hour, you're using one megawatt hour of electricity. So how many of these would you need in order to, uh, in order to use the amount of power that was used in the United States for the course of a year? You'd need 460,000 Oracle ballparks running their lights 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So how many power plants would you need to power all of this? Well, I mentioned that the largest generating units can be a gigawatt. Um, and, a, and if you were to use gigawatt-sized power plants, you'd need, in effect, 460 power plants, gigawatt-sized power plants running all day and all night, if the lights are running all day and all night. So I guess all we need are 460 very large power plants, right? Well, no, because the reality is we don't use power evenly all day and all night. The load, the demand from customers varies on the time of day. And so you end up developing uh, uh, a, hypo here's a hypothetical version of a load curve that's talking about how much is being used, how much demand at any instant is being made by customers <laughs> at any particular time. And so you can see that you have a certain amount of power that's probably going to be needed all day, all night. But then there are going to be different hours during the day where the demand level is going to be different. And you're going to want to have lots of power plants, some very large, some very small, to try to accommodate this level of load as it changes throughout the day. Here's the base load amount, 24 hours a day, you're going to need this much. Then you're going to have demand up at a level that's referred to here as shoulder demand. Then peak is at the very top. So how are we going to manage this, this kind of a load? Um, let's consider the classic power plant. In most instances, what we're doing is we're taking a fuel, we're taking energy to create heat or steam, and using that steam or heat to push a paddle around on a turbine, and using that turbine to generate electricity. So how do you get that turbine moving? There are kind of three classic models. There's what's referred to as a gas turbine. Uh, this is a power plant where you take a gas, inject it in a cylinder, ignite it, and immediately it's going to expand and the energy that's being released can push the turbine around. Then there's what's referred to as a steam turbine. And what you're doing here is you're taking a fuel and you're using it to boil water or some other liquid. And you're taking the steam from that process and using that to push the turbine around and generate electricity. Um, then the third type 
is what's referred to as combined cycle. We take both of those technologies. You start with a gas, use that gas to, uh, you explode the gas and use it to push a turbine. Then you take the waste heat from that process, use it to boil water, create steam, use that steam to push a paddle around. So this is considered to be a much more efficient process because it uses the same fuel to generate electricity twice. Well, let's go back and consider these technologies again for a moment. So what we're doing here with a, a gas turbine is where we have a process that's very simple, uh, but it's also very inefficient, uh, and it's going to waste a lot of uh, energy in the way toward producing electricity. But in order to get there, you have to start with a gas. So natural gas uh, is really going to be the ma main fuel for this purpose now. Sometimes people take coal and turn that into a gas, and you can use that as well. Um, but for, uh, for the uh, steam turbine, you can rely on something that may not be a gas to start with. You can take coal in its solid state. You can take a, a nuclear reaction that's creating heat, and you can use these things to generate water, while the uh, while, uh, steam from water. While the gas turbine is very flexible, you can turn them on and off very, very quickly and adjust them. The steam turbine, not so much, because you actually have to ignite a fuel, and you have to let it build up a certain amount of heat, and then you have to have it create enough steam to create enough pressure, and then you have to use it at that point to push the turbine around. So it's a slower process. Ramping a combined cycle plant up and down is even slower. And so uh, when you know you have a certain amount of baseload demand, what are you going to do? You're going to turn to uh, the combined cycle plants or maybe the uh, steam turbines, less flexible to turn on and off. But also, they're usually able to produce each individual kilowatt hour at a lower cost. The cheapest thing to build is a gas turbine. The most expensive thing to operate is a gas turbine. It's inefficient. The most expensive thing to build of these examples would be a combined cycle, but it's also going to be the cheapest to operate because the fuel cost is going to be low. So what are you going to do? You're going to want to turn to the lowest cost fuel from the least flexible, flexible plants to run for the longest period of time. And then when you get to those peak periods, the shoulder periods or the peak periods, then you turn to the less efficient, more expensive to operate power plants like the gas turbines. Not only they are they less efficient and more expensive, they also are dirtier. So you're going to get more pollution out of those plants than you will out of the more efficient power plants. It's another reason you wanted to save those gas turbines uh, for only a few hours a day. Um, what are we using in terms of fuels in the United States? Uh, here are a couple of of graphs from the uh, Energy and Information Administration uh, that are trying to uh, reflect um, the fuel use um, in, uh, in 2019. Um, on the left, you can see that coal uh, is uh, a diminishing source. They're predicting as time goes by. Uh, the dotted line reflects the more current time. So everything to the left is historical. Everything to the right is a forecast. And they're predicting uh, that coal use is going to taper down a little bit and level off. Nuclear use is going to stay about the same. It's renewable use that's going to build up to a higher level, but unfortunately, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, so is natural gas use. In terms of breaking down what those renewables are going to look like, and we'll talk about this stuff in a lot more detail in class, you can see that they're anticipating as time goes by, solar is going to be more and more of a factor. Uh, wind is going to continue to expand as well. Uh, you can see that wind was a much uh, more dominant factor early on. For these calculations, they're including hydroelectric power of all kinds, the large plants and the small plants as well. So let's move on to generation and talk for a couple of minutes about transmission. There are basically two ways that we tend to transmit power long distance. They're over lines that are referred to as alternating current lines or over lines that are referred to as direct current lines. In most instances, it's alternating current that's being used. What does that mean? Well, think of the generation of electricity by a turbine as being a circular function. And so an alternating current has wires taking power off the generator at two points. And those points are going to be at opposite places in the cycle. So the power is going to, a current is going to be flowing back and forth at an extremely rapid rate. Uh, it will continue to move to, in an outward motion but within that motion, there's going to be a lot of back and forth uh, in the wires. Direct current, as the name implies, 
is power that just moves only in one direction, and um, and it's uh, that they take power off of the rotor at uh, at many different locations around the circle. We'll talk a lot more about the implications of AC versus DC as time goes by. And then, of course, one of the more important things to think about when you think about generation, think about the grid, is bowling. Why are we looking at that? Because think about how the ball comes back after you roll it down the alley. This is one type of, uh, just one type of, uh, of a ball return, but a ball comes up here after, after it's gone down the, the channel. Uh, over here it comes up and hits a little kid in the nose and then continues after that. And where's it going to go from there? Well, that's the more interesting part. There are different kinds of things, uh, ways to receive the ball. This is referred to as a carousel. And the carousel uh, has uh, one interesting component to it, which is that if a ball is coming straight down the middle, you don't necessarily know which way that ball is going to go. Is it going to go to the left or is it going to go to the right? Well, let's just hypothetically decide that the next ball in this instance comes down and settles in on the right. Then the question is, where's the next ball going to go? Well, that might be a little easier to decide. I'll animate it for you. The ball comes down, it hits the ball on the right, and moves off to the left. Electricity is very much like this. Electric current, as it flows, uh, tends to go to the place of least resistance. And uh, that's why the power continues to move in an outward direction. But it also means that when you look at the electric grid, which we'll look at in more detail in a minute, which consists of many, many different transmission lines going in different locations, the power is not going to flow just from point A to point B, from where you are generating it to where you want it to go. It's going to go into this grid and find the place with the least resistance and it's going to move in that direction. So this is uh, basically what the grid looks like in the United States. Uh, and you can see that it's actually considered, it's divided into three major components in the lower 48 states. You have the western interconnection, the eastern interconnection, and then the uh, Republic of Texas down here. And they all function as separate independent grids. Now, sometimes you might want to take power and move it from one of these grids to another, and it's going to be tricky. And so let's talk a little bit about what that looks like. Imagine you're jumping rope. You're in the playground. There's a big rope. You've got a person at each end pulling that rope around. You see all these kids jumping up and down. Uh, you'll notice they're all up in the air at the same time. So um, what happens if somebody else wants to join in? Well, they're going to have to look at the way the rope's going around, see how people are jumping, and make sure that they come in exactly the right time at the right place in the cycle in order to be able to jump, allow the rope to pass underneath, and then come to the down and then jump up again, etc. cetera. Uh, it works fine until somebody messes up. If somebody gets out of sync, uh, then they're going to trip on the wire and maybe everybody else is going to wind up falling down as well. And again, the electric grid is kind of the same. Why? Uh, because these cycles of the power going back and forth uh, are measured and Normally in the grid, they're running at about 60 cycles per second, 60 round trips per second. And the, the different grids have all of their power plants in sync. They're all moving around in the same cycle. To the extent to which there are these power plants that use a turbine, the turbines are spinning in the top, or at the top and the bottom at the same time, uh, regardless of where they are within the interconnection. So there's a certain frequency, a certain cycle to the power in the western interconnection or in the eastern interconnection. And you can't take power and move it directly from one cycle to another inter uh, interconnection with a different cycle. Uh, because if you did that, then you're likely to uh, trip up the, the, uh, the, the system and you might cause uh, a major power outage in one place or another. Uh, substation. You take this power off the transmission line and then you break it down into smaller uh, voltages. It's very high voltage in the transmission lines. You break it down into, uh, with transformers into lower voltages. Then you split it off into lots of lines that move through the distribution system uh, onto, uh, onto uh, uh, poles usually, usually above ground. Sometimes they're under the ground. Um, and uh, here you can see up on this pole a uh, uh, cylinder that's a transformer. This one happens to be on the pole outside my house. And the transformer 
takes the power and breaks it down to even a small, lower level, lower voltage level, in order to make it more usable uh, by appliances in people's homes and in people's businesses. There are thousands and thousands of miles, uh, tens of thousands of miles of these distribution lines and transmission lines. Maintaining these systems is a major challenge. It's one of the things that really has contributed to the problems we've seen in Northern California with wildfires, and we'll be talking about that, I'm sure, a good bit as the semester goes by. When the lines get to your house, there's a drop that goes from the poles to your house or to a business, and then you connect to a meter. And this is a classic mechanical meter right here that measures each kilowatt hour. The uh, dial on the right moves from zero to zero <laughs> as it moves around. You're counting up here, it's on the right right now, it's at four. When it gets all the way back up to zero, it's gonna push the next dial up one notch. It'll go from what's now at about two and a half up to, uh, up to three. And then when that gets all the way around to zero again, it pushes the next one. And so you, you, have, you have a measurement that can be made. Somebody can come out and read the meter, look where each number is on the dial, put those all down in a piece of paper, and that adds up to, to a number that tells you where uh, the meter is at that particular point. You compare it to the reading you had the last time, and it shows you the difference between those two is the amount of power that was used, and that's what you charge people for. This is a very simple meter. It does, it, all it measures is the amount of kilowatt hours going by. It doesn't know what time to use them. It doesn't know how much they cost at the time. And, uh, and it provides a very simple result that has to be measured by somebody going out there and actually looking right at the meter. Well, over the course of time, we've seen these things being replaced now with what people often refer to as smart re meters. And a smart meter is uh, computerized. It has two-way communication with the utilities offices. Um, and it can measure uh, what power you're using at any particular time and communicate that information back. Uh, so uh, if, the, for instance, you're in a place where the power is charged at a different rate at a different time, you need a meter like this to be able to know what time the power was actually used. More and more utilities around the country have been converting from the mechanical meters to these smart meters. California, uh, as an example, has pretty much completed that process. Uh, so only two other things I want to mention now. One is that the grid, because it has to be in balance, that means that you always have to have the same amount of power going in as you have, the, have being demanded by customers. In other words, supply and load have to match each other. Uh, you have to keep the voltage level up. You have to uh, keep the, the uh, cycle constant in terms of that number close to 60 cycles per second. And if, if any of these things start to fail, you have problems. If you have more power than you have load, then you're burning out your uh, transformers. If you have less load than you have, less power than you have load, then you're going to have uh, a voltage drop and the whole system might fail. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the other thing to, to remember is that uh, it's basically not possible for our purposes to store electricity. People talk about storing energy all the time. They talk about having batteries. And we'll talk about battery, battery systems. But the reality is a battery is not storing electricity. What it's doing is taking electric current and using it to charge the battery which means you have the potential to generate electricity. And when you need the power from the battery, you, collect the two you connect the two terminals, and then you get a current. Then it's making an effect to the battery. It's creating electricity at that moment. So electricity cannot be very well stored. Uh, it's a time variant kind of thing. Uh, and so it's that movement that has to be constant. It's that uh, balance in terms of the supply and demand, that balance in terms of synchronized system. Uh, the balance in terms of keeping the voltage level up. Those things have to be maintained at all times or the system fails. And this means that sometimes the grid operators are going to have to uh, make some desperation purchases. They may need to get power regardless of price, regardless of type, in order to keep the system in balance if other things aren't working very well. Uh, this chart, and we won't go over, I won't go over it in detail, but you're welcome to look at it uh, at your leisure reflects the fact that some things can be done to adjust and manage the grid in the, in the fraction of a second. Some things can take years. Obviously, the things that happen very quickly have to be automated. You have to have sensors and cutoff devices and things that can function very much on their own. Things that take minutes 
uh, might require an operator deciding to flip a switch. Things that take days could involve deciding, deciding well, it's getting hotter, there's going to be higher air conditioning load, we better ramp up a couple more power plants and have them ready to go. Things that take months can be things where you know there's a need to, for instance, uh, refuel a nuclear power plant. It's got to be taken out of service for many weeks, so you have to figure out how you're going to, going to uh, uh, substitute for that. Uh, things can take years when you realize you need another power plant or you need another transmission line, planning them, getting them approved, getting them built, getting the operation can take a very long time and so things can take years. Um, the grid, I hope the one takeaway you'll take from this is one big machine. Everything, all the way down to the meter, one big machine. Uh, and it's one of the largest machines that we use in a, in a, in a society. Uh, and it has to be very carefully managed. And so you'll find that there are control centers looking something like this, where you've got some computer readouts on the screen, you've got a lot of individual monitors for individual operators who are responsible to track different kinds of conditions, or perhaps be the liaison with different types of power supplies, so they can get those, those power supplies uh, when they need to. Well, this is basically our quick tour of the grid, and uh, I, I hope you'll find it useful. Please uh, ask me questions about this if uh, there are things you'd like me to help uh, clear up or if you want to see some other materials to read.